from Denmark, Mr. Mikael Schoenbold. Mikael. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here, especially since I'm neither a musician nor a manager. Um, conductors are sometimes perceived as being only conductors because they can't make any music, so they have to have other people to, to do it for them. And um, conductors are sometimes perceived by managers as dreamers with no sense of reality. So I'm sort of with a leg hanging between two chairs and I can't really get there, uh, is the idea. But I can tell you I most certainly did when I started here. Um, I started as music director for the Radio Kammer Philharmonie, which you'll hear tonight, in September of uh, 2010. Two weeks after I started, we had these dr draconic cuts from the Dutch government, uh, which in their initial government uh, message said that they would cancel, abandon the music centrum of the Dutch radio altogether. Seven words, ladies and gentlemen, seven words. Um, cutting 60 years of music tradition in this country, cutting the work of 400 people. And I've just been there for two weeks. Give me a chance right before you do this. But, but this, was, um, this was a lethal blow, but more about that later on. But I've been thinking of um, my position here, why you've uh, invited me as a conductor to come and, con and speak here. And I think the reason is, I think, perhaps I should state the idealism and uh, say we should never forget why we're in this profession, why we're working with this. I, uh, I almost hasten to use the word profession. Certainly to me, it's a dedication. It's a thing I can't live without. Um, and I'm sure, and I pray that that's the case for you as well, that the reason why we work with music, uh, spend our whole life, traveling around the world, thinking of music every second of our day, is because we can't live without it. Because music has such, is such a serious, deep language between human beings that the world would be much, much, much worse without it. Um, I all, one of my doctor friends told me that uh, when a child in his or her mother's womb is eight weeks old, the child can hear. That's the first sense that any child has. So that means that we spent seven months, we, we spent seven months before we were born seeing, perceiving the world through sound, which again means that what we hear is something that goes far beyond the word, the, inte the intellect, right down to the bottom of our senses, which again means that if we get the right sound, we communicate on a level that no other communication can work on. And that I, th I think is fascinating. That's, I'm sure it's the reason why we spend so much time on making music. And that is why governments are afraid of music, because music is uncontrollable. Um, I, sp I performed with uh, Pekka Kusisto from Finland uh, two days ago. He told me that in Finland, one of the great right-wing parties who is now probably going to have a major if not the most important position after the elections in a couple of weeks' time, have come out with the message that they will only support Finnish art with Christian view. <laughs> Take that. Um, and they mentioned they would, only, they would not um, support Swedish as a, as a language in Finland anymore, and they would, only, uh, they would raise three uh, artists in Finland as the most important for Finnish culture. Sibelius, for instance, two others writers. Now, the interesting thing are, is all of these three were Swe Swedish-speaking, but th it doesn't really fit together, right? But they, they've invented a wonderful word set and called postmodernistic fake art. Postmodernistic fake art. They won't support at all. Now, that scares me because I've, I have a German background. Um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the word in Arte de Kunst, in Arte de Musique, was very close. This is the same. Um, I did Mendelssohn, uh, Midsommar Night's Dream Complete in, in Berlin when I was there, and I got the music, which was old music, and it was burned all the way around here. 
And I asked why, why the music was still like that. And they told me, well, you see, uh, in the 30s, um, the librarian of the, uh, the then German radio music library was told to destroy all Mendelssohn's music because this was in Art de Kunst. And he couldn't bear the thought, so he, he made a hole in the radio hall, radio uh, house basement, put the music in there, and closed it with bricks. The, whole, the radio house was bombed, but after the war they dug it out. The music was still there, and it was just slightly burned all the way around. Now, that brought deep tears into my, uh, my eyes, of course. That's the way music is being treated now. Um, I'm afraid that we've now spent 100 years almost building up institutions for serious music in order to establish orchestras, um, in order to establish opera houses and all the other institutions on a basis where there should be the, the biggest possibility for making music. Now this acceptance in our bourgeois society or popular society has been there for 100 years but that acceptance is rapidly going as you just mentioned, um, obviously highlighted by the financial crisis we've just had. So what I find is that we've now come to a, a situation where the acceptance for our big institutions, for, the, for using the amount of money we're using on culture today, is rapidly declining. And what's the reason behind that? Not just money. Um, I think we've now gone through 30 years of music education, or rather lack of music education, certainly in my country, and I think it goes for most European countries. And we have now um, politicians in front of us leading our countries who have no real contact with serious art. We have, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, of course we should have orchestras uh, or a orchestra, we should have one truth, and then, but we should also have something else. This is a very easy way of winning a lot of votes. It doesn't cost very much, but you win a lot of votes like this. It looks as if you're doing a lot of things and it has lethal consequences on things that we have been working on for 50, 60 years. Um, we see no uh, faithfulness to what's been built up by the previous generations. If I were talking to my bank the way some of the politicians are speaking to me, you're saying, you know, okay, it might be my father who's, who put this mortgage on the house, but I've now inherited it and that mortgage doesn't interest me. If I talked like that to my, to my bank, I would be put in jail. Uh, but this is the way that um, a lot of politicians speak to us today. You know, what the previous generation did doesn't really concern me. So we are now being pushed back to seeing serious music as elitist again. Something, something for the rich few, and if you can f find the money for it yourselves, fine. Otherwise, sorry. Um, that is very, very serious. But on the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, let me also take the opportunity to say, like, should we look inwardly ourselves? We've now spent 50, 60 years, 100 years, building up these institutions. Are they really in balance with the, the, the society we have today? Have we built up institutions that basically cater for a society that doesn't exist anymore? I'm just putting this a bit provokingly to you, because I think we need to address this subject.